Nothing changes instantaneously. In a gradually heating bathtub, you'd be boiled to death before you knew it. Our Father, who art in heaven. Seriously? What the actual fuck? Gilead doesn't care about children. Gilead cares about power. Why does healing have to be the only goal? Why can't we be as furious as we feel? For whatever man sows, so shall he reap. Welcome to Above the Garage. Hi, friends. Welcome to our analysis of Season 5, Episode 9 of The Handmaid's Tale, which is entitled Allegiance. This is Bradley Whitford's Handmaid's Tale directorial debut, which we are so excited for. And the episode was written by Eric Tuckman, who also wrote a lot of our favorite episodes and specifically Nick and June scenes, especially 409 Progress. But let's do our round of introductions and dive in. Hi, I'm Rachel. Hi, I'm Tina. Hi, I'm Ginger. Hi, I'm Melissa. Hi, I'm Kimberly. Hi, I'm Mary Gold. And I'm Kate. Quick aside, we actually had the honor of interviewing the Putnams together this morning, and my voice did not sound like that then. I have progressively gotten sick as the day goes on. And so I apologize for my voice, but tune in Friday when our interview with Ever Carradine and Stephen Kunkin, aka the Putnams, comes out. It's amazing. You're going to love it. They're lovely people. Okay, back to the episode. So this episode opens in an airport hangar. The raid is on. The first actual mission to get Hannah in the five years of the show. Yeah. Very exciting. We find out the school is actually still in Colorado Springs. And I'm like, you guys, Nick told you that like three weeks ago and nobody cared to act. But I guess some combination of the threat of New Bethlehem and Hannah in wife school has finally changed Mark's mind as to his motivation in rescuing Hannah. And we learned that the wife school has been set up in a former Air Force Academy where some friendlies there have identified 30 girls they want to get out, all stolen from their parents. Likely the same friendlies from which Nick got his information a couple weeks ago. I thought in between Nick's intel and the video, or in, in between that and the, I guess the funeral, actually, it seemed like she elevated to wife school in between that. Unless, yeah, she used to be at a, yeah, she was at a, um, you know, domestic art school when he brought June the data and she was wearing pink and now she's mm-hmm. in wife school wearing purple. So yeah, it did, it has changed. I wonder if maybe at the school there's like a lot more kids than like at the wife school. Probably. Yeah. Oh, it could be. Well, they mentioned that it's 30 girls who were all stolen. Yeah, so like he made girls. a point to mention that. So it almost made it seem like made, they must have handpicked these girls to be the first wives in this new school that they're trying out. Yeah. But back to the mission, they're sending three planes of elite military troops and paratroopers will jump from the first plane and help the other two land. Most importantly, they will kill anyone who gets in their way. And we get to meet the man in charge of the mission, Commander Elijah Vance. Oof. I'm just going to stop right here and ask yeah. if anyone yeah. has any thoughts. <laughs> Commander <laughs> Hottie. Commander Vance. <laughs> Those eyes. Well, oh just like, my I, God. They're hypnotizing. He's a beautiful man. He could get beautiful. anyone to do anything. I love that he was, um, he's called a commander. I know he's like a military commander, but it was a great parallel to Gilead. It is interesting, right? But he's a good guy trying yeah. to save the kids, you know, a good dad. I would have jumped out of a plane uh, if he had asked me to. And I, I'm scared of heights. <laughs> <while I'm saying. laughs> to go help Hannah. Going straight into Gilead. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently the actor was on The Bachelor, which I did not know really? until someone really? told me. Yeah. Interesting. Really. I think maybe he was like on The Bachelorette. Sorry. Like right. So he'd be one of, one of the yeah. guys. Yeah. One of the guys. Yeah. When you see like OT and Lizzie walk up, I feel like they're in a trance, like looking into <laughs> <the> <laughs> Yeah. Both of them. Uh, on with the mission. He knows all about Hannah, and when June tries to explain to him that the kids are going to be scared, he cuts her off quickly but kindly, telling her he's a dad too, and even showing her a picture of his daughter, Emma. He confidently tells her he plans to bring her daughter back home and go home to his. And you can tell June relaxes as much as possible with Hannah in Elijah's hands. June being June, she demands to be allowed to watch the mission with Tuello from the command center because they got the intel to make this happen. So then we see Luke and June driving. June's lost in thought out the window. They said the wife school was at what was an old Air Force base. I thought that was really interesting. Like they must want to keep it really private or really secure. Or yeah. they suspected maybe when they came up with this whole thing that something like this might try and happen um, yeah. with Hannah. That's a good point. Probably why they're able to defend it so well, eh? Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I wonder yeah. if, you know, Hannah being like the symbol or like, being at risk because of who her mother is had something to do with why this is all like so secure maybe 
Yeah, I'm sure that this was a trap. My only thing was that uh, Tuella makes me laugh because he's always like, well, he always tells things to June and June's like, no, that's not happening. He's like, oh, all right. <laughs> he, just, <laughs> he just moves on with it like, okay, fine. I know. <laughs> I think it's funny. I'm like, I think that Tuella is a little bit scared of June. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Probably after that night when she's screaming, I will yeah. kill you. And then the next night she kills Fred and he's like, oh, she's serious. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. <laughs> She did make a good point, though. The thing she said about other families didn't bring you the intel that. Yeah, because I was like, well, she's she's got a point because at first he was pushing back like, no, you can't watch. And she's like, hey, (laughs) we're the ones who brought you the intel that got you here. So meanwhile, back at Serena's handmade gig, she's getting photos taken of Noah for the Gilead Fertility Center. And Serena suggests that actually having them there in the flesh at the opening would be even better. Mrs. Wheeler laughs that off as ridiculous idea. Serena points out that that's the job I came here to do, and Mrs. Wheeler reminds her that she's a guest now. Guest meaning prisoner, and her husband doesn't answer to those commanders with the best head shake, which I is amazing. Then they get into a little power struggle over breastfeeding versus pumping, and I think for the first time, Alanis Wheeler straight up calls the baby hers. Yeah. My smart boy won't get confused. And orders Serena to pump for the next time, and Serena acquiesces, crying as she takes the baby for one last feed. And I just want to say something here that someone said on Twitter on our page. Everybody follow us on Twitter and Instagram. DS Cunning 27, aka Tootie is a Team Black, said, even though Serena's situation, and this is actually a loose quote, but even though they want us to feel bad for Serena, Serena's worst day here has been better than June's best day at the Waterfords. And that's so true. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I still like what they've done with it. And you know, basically turned into a handmaid without turning into a handmaid, but mm-hmm. it doesn't even compare even no, like, for the two weeks she's been here or however long. I guess she's been here for a couple months. Which is funny because Serena can't handle it and she keeps whining to June of all people about right. how awful it is. Right. Like, I can't. And it's a yeah. million times better. She's allowed to breastfeed. She's not being like beaten. It keeps reminding me of what June said to Serena when she confronted her at the um the other prison because when she used the word fraction I keep thinking about how this isn't even a fraction of what what June went through when she was at the Waterford yeah yeah absolutely when Alanis wants that Serena start pumping again I can't help but think it's because they want to get rid of Serena and keep Noah so um it's also crazy that Alanis says that Noah is missing the bottle, you know, uh, even though it's yeah. clearly easier to feel mm-hmm. uh, right. to feel a human, human with a bottle yeah. <laughs> uh, than breastfeed. And also it's very clear that the baby wants his mom because as soon as uh, Serena picks him up, Noah comes down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the same as, as before with the Waterfords, like everything that Alanis is saying defies logic the same way everything, all of it, Serena's instincts when June was in her house defied logic. And it's, it's, it's the same type of parallel. Well, I, th- I thought it was interesting because Alanis was, when Serena was taking the picture, she's like, it has to be perfect. It's going in the reception area. And the first thing people will see and immediately, it just reminds me of that where she's like, on the outside that like good little Gilead representative where she's making everything look perfect and formal and lovely but underneath it's just sinister and evil and awful like but you know she portrays that so well Genevieve is just incredible yeah she's great I had a comment that just real quick that I love Genevieve's diction in this scene the way she says pump pump <laughs> it just like pumps mm-hmm. in her mouth I just love that like <laughs> the way she delivers her lines is just perfection yeah and did, did everyone notice there was a moment where Serena was gonna push back on Mrs. Wheeler until you could almost see in her head she was remembering what June said about yeah you need to play the part and you need to like you know stay in line until you can get you know what you need to do like done I thought that was really um really cool little like nod yeah Mm -hmm. i'd love to know more about um mr wheeler specifically just because she says um that her husband doesn't answer to those commanders and i just love to know backstory about like how and why and when and how when why when (laughs) yeah (laughs) all of it it's a pretty sweet deal though for the wheelers especially mr wheeler because they get to like be the gilead people they want to be and try to have control and do things that the way they do it, but they get the freedom of mm-hmm. not being in Gilead to actually do the things they want to do, which is ironic because it's kind of that perfect world that Serena wanted. Like she wants to have control 
and run her own like pseudo Gilead, but she didn't like being in Gilead because they took away her rights because she's a woman. So this is like, it's kind of a cool parallel, I guess. Yeah. I took it as like, she was just having like a power trip. I feel like they would have to answer to the Gilead commanders on what to do with Serena. They don't have another Lydia and Lauren scene, but something's different this time, especially when he seems genuine when he tells Lydia he appreciates her being here. Like, he's very nervous about something and he's seeking comfort from Lydia. <laughs> what is going on? I also thought it was funny that the way they're sitting, because he's in a chair and she's standing by him. And when I first yeah. saw it, I'm like, it reminds me of like Santa and Mrs. Claus. <laughs> 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 that fits. Then uh, another extremely nervous human enters the scene. It's Naomi Putnam. I don't think we've ever seen her more nervous, which makes sense, since her husband was just shot without warning on the orders of this man who has apparently summoned her. Lawrence offers her tea, and she seems to regret saying no thank you, and adds, no, but you guys can have tea. Lawrence is like, no, I hate tea, and it's just like deliciously awkward. So Lawrence gets to the point. He's been considering what to do about Naomi's future, and she interrupts with her biggest fear. Please don't send me to the colonies. And Lawrence and Lydia are completely taken aback that that's what she thinks that they called her here for, that they'd ever think such a thing. And my favorite line comes after he says she's not at fault for her husband's sins. And he continues, are you kidding? That guy? And it's just so funny. <laughs> Delivery. Um, and, he's, and then he continues, no, he deserves a reward for putting up with him. And she's suddenly like, oh, a reward? I was laughing through the entire scene. Ever's amazing in this scene. Yeah. I wonder what reward, like, Naomi thought she was going to get, like, a few macaroon <laughs> towels or, like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, she's just very... She was so excited. Materialistic? I don't know, but she was. She yeah. was so excited. And Lawrence is like, um, sort of, because we're talking about him now as the reward. <laughs> <laughs> and Lydia, Lydia tells her she can't remain a widow with a young child and continue to live in her house. And Naomi hilariously thinks, oh, I get it now. Oh, okay. Oh, it's just the house is too big. No problem. I get that. You can have that. You Just find me a nice condo in Brookline or Back Bay. <laughs> and Lawrence is like, for Christ's sake, we're not your realtors. And the, the propo- I just, I like when proposals go like horribly astray and none has ever gone like as poorly as this one. It's a good scene. Finally, it's like, for fuck's sake, Lawrence, just, may I suggest you get to the fucking point? She didn't say for fuck's sake, but it'd be cool if she did. And Lawrence issues the most romantic marriage proposal. It's a quid pro quo. You need security. I need to represent traditional Gilead values. So you can move in here with the kid if you want. The kid. And Naomi voices my exact thoughts perfectly. Uh, this is a marriage proposal? Yep. Yuppers. I think Lawrence says yuppers. The way he's like <laughs> slapping his knees and he's like, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Like, <laughs> He was so happy so, he did not have to say marriage proposal. Yeah. He was like, oh, thank God you said it. Yeah. <laughs> and then just, so what do you say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. If anybody from Hulu is listening and you have access to give us, like, the outtakes for the, from oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Please, 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 please. like, please. Send it. <laughs> email it to us. Thank you so much. All our money. <laughs> This is a delightful scene. I laughed so much. I was hanging over. <laughs> Lydia drops some Gilead bullshit, and they all talk about how much everyone loves First Corinthians, which we do, right? Because <laughs> um, and Lauren takes his leave, telling her it's just a suggestion. Think about it. And then he eavesdrops from the hallway as Naomi points out her very obvious hesitation. Um, that dude had Warren killed in front of me. Like I don't even know how many days ago. Lydia t- <laughs> Lydia tells her he's willing to overlook that. I wouldn't he be. <laughs> And so should Naomi, as Lawrence looks heartbroken in the hall. Like, what did you guys think of how nervous and sad he was here? Does, oh, does he actually have a thing for Naomi? Like, it was feeling to me like no. he yeah. had a thing for Naomi. I think Naomi. it's the opposite. I think he's thinking of Eleanor. <laughs> but it's definitely yeah. not something I've ever seen. Okay. Yeah. All right. He was sad because well, the whole the whole yeah. season, he talks about, like, he doesn't want to get married. And he keeps talking about yeah. Eleanor. So I think this is, like, if he does this, like, he's officially. Yeah. Like, that tie is broken. Like, he'd have to take off that wedding ring i mean i don't know if he got a new one but basically it's like that marriage is over and he doesn't want that i can literally see him in a wedding ceremony just taking it off and then having handing it to her and have her put it back on him like i can (laughs) yeah i wouldn't be surprised if they got married and he was like you want your condo like you can go have your condo with the kid right like Like, he just needs a wife come to dinner when we need yeah Yeah. exactly 
I don't even know if I got that it was a sentimental moment. He may have been thinking about Eleanor, but I think it was more that this is like yeah, yeah. shit. Like, like I don't know, like that he has to do this because I think he would have been yeah. perfectly fine, perfectly happy, just living out his days as a bachelor until he died. Mm-hmm. He yeah, did not want yeah. a wife. He did not want to take a wife. But right. I think, you know, he understands the practicality of it. And of course, that the other commanders keep reminding him of how he needs to follow Gilead values. And so he's been pushed into a corner he has to do this he's being forced yeah can you imagine him with naomi as his wife and the the little kid running around i mean he's no. gonna be bad as- he's gonna hate it so much yeah mm-hmm. well, it's gonna be terrible. serena was such a better option for me for lawrence serena and lawrence i feel like could like at least naomi like naomi probably won't cause like the trouble that serena no. would. yeah that's yeah. what i was thinking yeah. she'll let him do his thing and just you know I got my macaroni towers. You go do your thing. We're all good. Yeah. It's funny though, because he's got like his two proposals this season, like arranged marriages and both of them are with women who have kids. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I felt that he was nervous. Um, He doesn't like marriage. You know, he's doing only because he had to do it. And also it it was kind of weird. The wording that, and Lydia said that he has to do it to be a, a true leader in, yeah. in Gilead. He needs to uh, marry. So yeah. the wording is like, it's very interesting, you know? Yeah. He basically right. has to do it. Otherwise, mm-hmm. like Mackenzie's going to get on his ass again, yeah. probably. Yeah. I guess I was also surprised he was like eavesdropping in the hall after. Like to me, Lawrence would have yeah. been like, all right, I did that piece. And like, I don't know, yeah. whatever he does, listen to his music or whatever. Maybe he just like wanted to know like if what she was out. thinking. Yeah. Like, is, 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 is she actually going to say yes or am I going to yeah. have to force this on her? Yeah. Which mm. she, right. <laughs> she did say to him, though, um, I have a choice and she looked horrified. And he had said that's hurtful. Yeah. So I was kind of thinking. That was so funny. I was kind of thinking, though, that like he kind of feels bad because he doesn't like the ceremony. Like he's never been into that and he's not into like forcing women. Like that was never a part of his vision. He's not into forcing women to do things. So I, I think maybe he said that like as a joke, but also to kind of play off like she's making it sound like I'm being, she's being forced to do this and he's not that kind of guy and doesn't want to force a woman to make a choice. That's exactly how I took mm. it. Um, yeah. Like, I think he's way m- more good choice than other commander like mm-hmm. Putnam or yeah. uh, whatever. You know? Right, he doesn't yeah. want to be lumped in with guys like that, like actual rapists. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and Ginger, you just brought up a really good point I hadn't thought about because you mentioned how, you know, he doesn't want, he doesn't like the ceremonies. He doesn't want to force women. But Naomi was on board with the ceremonies. And I'm kind of curious, like his wife was in an agreement yeah. with him that she didn't want, even if they had a handmaid for for just um, the optics of it, she was fine with them not going through it because it horrified her. Naomi isn't of the same mindset. So it, it also makes me wonder if he's worried that now that this sort of foreign woman is coming, is invading his space and cramping his style, if he's going to be forced to do other things within the the Gilead values that he doesn't want to do. I suspect he thinks he can control her. I think that he, like, maybe they'll even get Esther's kid. I don't know. I don't want to think about that. But Mm. I feel like he can trump her. And I think that Naomi thinks that Lawrence is a killer because he saw that. But yeah, and yeah. maybe she's like she's right. She's right. Scared. But yeah. Also, yeah mm-hmm. She's scared, but also she. I don't know if she knows that Lawrence doesn't have ceremonies or. I don't think she knows that. Yeah. I liked in the scene that um Lawrence said, "I hate tea" because tea can also mean gossip, and I'm like, "Well, it's <laughs> ironic because he's <laughs> using the the tea or the gossip from Aunt Lydia to get." Yeah. His power in his position so <laughs> like, I like that double meaning really quick I loved his quid pro quo line because it reminded as soon as he said that it reminded me of when he said he was grooming Nick but not sexually which I still can't stop laughing at and I was like god he is like the stuff of HR nightmares with the way he keeps saying <laughs> like all these awful things and Serena's doing her very best June impression as she finds Mr. Wheeler alone by the fire late at night and she attempts to manipulate him. He's not as dumb as Fred, though, and the constant look on his face of not buying her shit and then finally saying, look, I think I'm suitably buttered up. Uh, what do you want? 
is just like fantastic acting by Lucas Neff, directing by Brad, obviously. Everything about these scenes so far, like I've loved so much. Then Yvonne delivers a good power Serena speech about why she should be at the Fertility Center opening. And he clearly prefers the last week Serena and responds, that's a nice pitch. And when she says, praise be, he looks back at whatever he's doing. And he's like, oh yeah. I don't know if you noticed, but when Serena opens the glass door to see the mis- Mr. Wheeler, you can see the image of the nightstands uh, overlap with the glass door and looks like the Gilead flag mm. because of the red. No mm. way. Yeah. The what? The Gilead what? Flag. That's so the cool. Gilead flag. Oh, shit. That's amazing. I did not catch that. Nice catch. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. I am. Um, I love how Mr. Wheeler, like, he only needed one because obviously this this scene is so different compared to the first scene that they had where it seemed like he was, I, I don't know if he was kind of into her, but, like, he was into, like, Serena being pregnant and the whole thing and, like, um, her wanting to go um, supposedly kill June and now he's just like, no. Nah. But, like, whereas Fred, like, he took, like, 50,000 times to realise June was, like, fucking with him. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so he obviously knows what's going on more than Fred right. does, which I thought was funny. I like that too. Even when Fred finally did, we were like, wait, does Fred get it now? No. Yeah. Now we're in the command room for the raid and watching the screens live. We see the planes moving towards the school, and I cannot rave enough about the music Adam Taylor wrote for these scenes. It, it elevates these scenes to me beyond. Uh, it's amazing. They're amazing. It's so amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it switches to Hannah's perspective, saying a goodnight prayer before they get into their creepy little alien pods. Hannah's turning the pages of her coloring book or drawing book or whatever this is, and she picks up a pen and she writes her name, her real name. Oh my God. I don't think those words could ever means so much as they do in this particular show it's a big fucking deal like that was shocking i had goosebumps like the whole time I know, that whole same thing. the whole thing because she she apparently is hiding a pencil yeah. she and that because yeah. she kind of gets it out of a stash and she's looking behind her to make sure nobody's seeing her she gets this this hidden well you know contraband pencil out and then she's in she takes out this drawing that apparently she's drawn and then writes her real name and I had a question about, I can't remember how old she was supposed to be when she was captured. Do you guys remember? Four or five. Yeah. Four or five. Those of you who have kids, is would she have already been reading and writing by, by five? I don't yeah. know. Her name. Yeah, yeah. she'd be writing yeah. her name. Yeah. Some yeah. numbers. Yeah. And she kind of wrote it like a four-year-old too. Like True. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just find it interesting that either she still retains that ability or because right. or somebody taught her. I feel like somebody taught her because I have so many questions now because now I'm thinking of Maybe like her Martha. Yeah, the Martha. When they the video was sent and she looked very suspicious. And she looks she at she watched. sees somebody she recognizes when in the video. She yeah, does a double she, take. And then she's got a pencil, like who someone had to give her that. And I do feel like somebody would have had to have maybe helped her write her name, right? Because even if you learn mm-hmm. how to write your name as a four-year-old, then you don't do it for what eight exactly. Years? Mm-hmm. Or maybe Mrs. McKenzie did. Like maybe her mom or her Martha, you know, helped her mm-hmm. retain some of that knowledge. Her Martha, maybe I could see maybe that. Yeah, Francis. Yeah. Francis was awesome. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, like not only does she remember her old life her real name but she's a rebellious badass Mm -hmm. and her mom risking writing she's not allowed to the power of names is such a big theme in this show that like i love it just so many chills but i loved how they intercut it with june though like they're showing hannah praying then they show june praying i just thought that the way they filmed that was just genius absolutely and like you said kate with the music the whole like the whole thing had me i had goosebumps the whole time i almost teared up a little bit when june first looked up the up at the live feed and she's like hey banana me too oh i'm so sweet the whole scene like i just love the whole thing like i reckon it's probably one of my faves it just gave me all the feels this is definitely my favorite scene in this episode i I love this scene yeah it's so gut-wrenching yeah then it's switching back and forth between june and hannah and june saying you're coming home banana when the planes turn into red circles on the screen and say, no data. They rush Luke and June out of the room. Get them out of here. And Mark comes into the hallway to confirm 
their fears and my fears. The planes were shot down. Elijah and all the elite crew are dead. Gilead anticipated their mission and they moved their anti-aircraft systems and took all three planes down as soon as they crossed the border. Luke is clearly devastated. June 2, for her, it's personal. Obviously, they've not gotten Hannah, but she also just met Elijah and saw a photo of his daughter. But it's also just more tallies on the unending list of the guilt she carries on her shoulders already. That's immediately what I thought. Like more guilt, more blood on her hands that she doesn't want. Yeah. We had we probably all had very strong suspicions it was not going to be a successful mission. Right. How did everyone think it was actually going to go wrong? Because in my head, I thought they were actually going to get much closer to the school. But they actually said the planes got shot down as soon as they went across the border. Yeah. Like I yeah, thought it was going to yeah. be a lot more dramatic where they actually got very, very close to getting yeah. Hannah and at the last mm-hmm. minute yeah. it all got ripped yeah. out from underneath them. I think I did too. I actually thought the polar opposite of what happened which was that Hannah was going to refuse to go somehow or fuck up the Oh, oh wow. I also wondered that they were going to reveal that she had been brainwashed and it was time to let go of that. That had always been my suspicion though that that if they tried to extract her that she would it would be it would be kicking and screaming because she's totally indoctrinated and that's her home. Right. However, yeah. because but, of the scene, yeah. now I'm maybe rethinking that. I don't know. I was just going to say they showed us in 403 that she seemed brainwashed. I mean, at least that's how she appeared when June saw her. Yeah. Which is probably scared shitless as well. Yeah, I think right. that's all yeah. we can tell from that is she's scared shitless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it makes sense. She's in a box and like her yeah. mom is a prisoner. like, And she doesn't look so tortured good. and looks <laughs> like shit. Her mom looks scary. So like I always thought that Hannah didn't really identify as herself as Hannah anymore. So like that was like a huge turning moment for me. Like I'm like, okay, there's hope that like she might yeah. want to leave Gilead. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that was a shocking moment. I thought me. maybe we might see like an aerial shot of like, you know how sometimes you can see the actual images like of what's mm-hmm. going on and I thought mm-hmm. maybe like they'd grab Hannah and like yeah they'd have like arms next to her and Hannah was like come and get me and then like mm-hmm. like someone from Gilead would like drag her away oh. yeah <laughs> yeah so I think that probably would have been You're even crueler than they are even yeah. crueler yeah. than what we saw but so yeah. I'm kind of glad that we did. yeah I I was thinking that there must be a mold within the American service is if they knew about the operation yeah i was wondering that too the wheelers yeah maybe the wheelers i don't know uh, i was talking to scarlet and we were talking that maybe the wheelers have some guy within the american service and and give that information to get that i don't know maybe in exchange for something else you know so i have this i have this really sad thought did Lauren set this whole thing up on purpose by sending her the CD and then knowing that June would not go with New Bethlehem? And then so, like, they he knew that June was going to set this whole thing up, like, well, giving Tuella the CD and then this would all happen. Like, this is my really horrible, horrible thought. Oh. I, think, I think you're right. I think so. Yeah. That was my, oh. my fear and that, that was... Uh, intentional to force and uh, doom to pick yeah. up a new bedlam because this was the the video and then Twello finding the location was like oh now I don't need to take up Lawrence on his offer because yeah. they're gonna yeah. they're gonna extract Hannah mm-hmm. this way this was like a last resort this was like you know the the last ditch attempt to try and get her daughter and like with this one failing it, it like she kind of you know she didn't seem to be, to to give up because she says we're, we're not there yet but she says to Twella what next what are we going to do now but it, it just sort of seems to me like that could be true that this last failed attempt would push her over the edge to like okay now I'll go to New Bethlehem well yeah. I kind of thought that too because when he when him and June have the phone call it made it seem like this was him so that's why I kind of mm-hmm. I hate to think, Kimberly, that your theory is true, but it seems Uh, like it probably is. Yeah, I'm so upset. I'm so upset by that. I'm just like, I'm devastated. (laughs) Like, well, and on the phone call, like he's probably hoping like, well, now that that failed, now she's going to, this is the phone call where she's going to say, okay, fine, I'll I'll go along with your your idea and I'll go to New Bethlehem. But the phone call did not go that way. Right. It Mm. it kind of would have illustrated her like, Hannah is not getting out. Like, look, you had this really good attempt at it. I have to go in she's not coming to you you have to come to her yeah but I find it hard to believe that Lawrence would think like okay now June is willing to go to New Bethlehem she knows that like 
he crossed her. I don't know. Like, he's a smart man. He's it's almost man. like delusioned by this whole idea of him. Like, yeah. Um, he really seems Creating to be. the New Bethlehem. He's pushing New Bethlehem. Yeah. yeah. It's like the power has gone to his head or something. I just feel like he wants so badly to try and yeah. um, create what he first wanted that Gilead to be. And exactly. it's, just, it's just all yeah. going kind of wrong so far and he's just trying to push it and push it and then just keeps getting worse and worse and worse (laughs) yeah it's like he's got a one-track mind and he can't yeah he's willing to go as far as he needs to go to make this happen which is just ironic because he's trying to make things better i don't know i guess it's that whole line of what what's fred's line better never means better for everyone right and it's almost like maybe that's kind of what i'm thinking of here where like he's trying to make it better for everyone but he's gonna make it worse for june yeah i think he's like willing to make sacrifices for the greater good like that's always been like his vision and there's gonna be some casualties and unfortunately he views june as one of those casualties i feel like of his decisions Next up, we have a phone call between June and Lawrence. He is just using June as a pawn now, it seems, which is unfortunate because I loved his relationship with June. And I also love him much more as a multidimensional character instead of just a straight up villain. He tells her she can still come to New Bethlehem. He doesn't have a lot of pity for, you know, what happened to the Hannah Ray. Presumably it's his fault. I mean, we don't know that, but it just kind of feels like that to me. He tells June she can still come to New Bethlehem and she can be with Nick because he's moving his family to New Bessie. And she's clearly affected by hearing this at first, but then she gets, I mean, like for a moment, and then she gets pissed and yells at him. Do you think you can just dangle Nick in front of me and get whatever you want? And when Lawrence pushes for her to publicly apologize for the Hannah rage, she just loses it. And she screams at him that Gilead is an evil place and you're still a part of it. You are, even though I know you don't want it. And he says he's doing what he promised Eleanor, trying to fix it step by step. And then June makes a very surprising decision, not just telling him that his wife hated him, but also that she watched her die. And he confirms our suspicions of his suspicions that he had already suspected she had something to do with it. But still says Eleanor would want him to help June and Hannah. Lawrence is crying. Bradley's incredible in the scene. I wonder what it's like directing yourself. Anyway, Lizzie is off the charts as well, as always. And she starts sobbing. She wants her baby safe and free, please. And he tells her it's never going to happen. And she clutches her locket and screams, go fuck yourself. I enjoy saying that too. I like the nearly done with the script. Anyway. <laughs> And she hangs up and starts destroying her garden, hitting it first with a shovel and then tearing out the plants by hand. And Luke comes out and restrains her as she begs him to let her go. And it feels like a much bigger picture let me go than just from that moment. But that's probably just my bias. I don't know. Did you guys think that or no? No, I like that he didn't let her go, to be perfectly honest with you, because she was like catatonic. I've been like that before. So don't let someone go. I thought it was just in the moment. I didn't think it was a larger just like let me go right no, now. No, I just I thought she literally meant let, yeah. let me go. Interesting. I agree with Kate. I, I, oh, I, yeah. no, I agree with you. I thought that she meant like let me go to New Bethlehem or go get Hannah. I was thinking yeah. the moment but it just bothered me that like I understand she was freaking out and there's those moments where you freak out and you kind of just need someone to like restrain you to calm you I guess but the fact that like a former rape victim is saying let me go and he's just like holding her tighter and saying it's okay it's okay it's okay and then she's like please Mm -hmm. let me go I'm like oh god Mm -hmm. this reminds me of her begging and it's just like it bothered me it it really bothered me no I didn't bother me like (laughs) at all I thought it was good that he didn't she needed to calm down just a little she was like shaking right after she hung up the phone very violently she was I'm torn here. I'm torn here because like as a rape victim, you should be able to say what you wish for your body and people listen. So I don't know. Yeah, but she eventually she got more calm down and yeah. yeah, but he wouldn't let her go, so she had to couldn't overpower him. But I don't know. I, I think he was sweet and I do he was yeah. I just had a quick note about her ripping up the garden. That felt very, very symbolic to me. Um remember how in the early episode she had her little garden in the house and we were we had talked about yeah. it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she was tending to the ha- the plants in the house, trying to help them grow. And I think it's very symbolic of her journey. Like, you know, she was trying to heal in Canada and she had the plants and now like everything is falling apart and she's just ripping up this garden and tearing it all to shreds. And yeah. she's tear- it's she's it's coming apart. You know, she's tearing that apart in the same way she is coming apart. Yeah. 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 I thought it was interesting because in this whole episode, I see so many parallels to 
409, which was written by the same, by Eric Tuckman. So like, because she has a call with Lawrence in that episode, so then now she's having a call with him in this one, but it's obviously a lot different. And Hannah was the topic of both of them. But, you know, I thought it was interesting where he said, Hannah is a symbol and so are you to June. I don't know if I really feel like he ever really looked at June as a symbol. I don't know. What do you guys think? He's hanging everything up on June being the symbol of New Bethlehem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. he wanted to, He wanted her to call the fucking, call the, um, I don't know, the yeah. TV, the radio stations and tell them. That was bold. You know, it was a oh. foolish act of aggression from the Americans. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, I think at this point, sadly, like what they've done with Lawrence's character, like I think he just views June and Nick as pawns. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that, what that's doing not as well. how I how I you know viewed Lawrence previously, but that's what they're doing. I think that's what they're trying to do. So, well, I think yeah. so too because I think that's why June got upset when he mentioned Nick because when, anytime yeah. anybody mentions Nick, she gets that look on her face. But I think she, as soon as he did that, she realized that he yeah. was purposely like dangling him in her face and then realizing him and Nick have been like you know aligned to each other and now I think she realizes like Nick is in danger because maybe I mean she doesn't know like what Nick knows does Nick know he's being manipulated too by him this is not safe for him either because Lawrence is playing us both they're both just a means to an end that's what they are Mm -hmm. they're a means to get new Bethlehem and that's what he wants yeah it's so sad because like to me like Lawrence like he always wants to get get what he wants obviously but he still cared about June and her feelings and what happened to her what happened to Hannah even Nick's like tiny little bit whatever but um I just hate if that's the way it seems to be going that he just doesn't give a fuck about June anymore and just wants this new Bethlehem thing because it just like devastates me personally and it yeah. would devastate Eleanor is the problem, yeah. and that's what he's motivated by. So that doesn't that doesn't make sense that he would, that's what he would do. But. The acting in this scene was so good, and Adam Taylor as well. When I think it was like in the middle of the conversation, where like massive heartbeat sounds started yeah. coming through, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Oh my god, They're this good. is giving me goosebumps all over." <laughs> The only other comment I had about this was with the point when she says, you think you can just dangle Nick and you and think I, I'll do whatever you want. She looked over her shoulder after she said that. It made me think that she was checking to see if Luke was like within. Yeah, I noticed shot. that. And I was like, oh, is he out there? That'd be awesome. <laughs> he wasn't. <laughs> I know you mentioned um, her locket, but I love that after our interview with Leslie, we know that the the locket is significant to June and the way that she clutched it made me think that maybe yeah. it's Hannah yeah. and Nicole and her locket. So. Yeah, that's yeah. what I think. I think it's right. the kids. And I like that we talked about it with her before it became obviously significant. Yeah, I, yeah, know. I probably too. wouldn't yeah. have noticed it otherwise. So, yeah. yeah. Props to Leslie. Awesome. She's amazing. That's coming out the following Friday. Then Serena is putting Noah in the car and Mrs. Wheeler comes out and slaps her twice. Warns her to stay away from her husband. I'm surprised he told her that Serena snuck down in the middle of the night to see him. Mrs. Wheeler calls her a whore and the maid is watching on. Obviously embarrassed for having seen Serena abused. And then the happy family gets in the car together. (laughs) I thought it was funny when she said, stay away from my husband. Like when she said that, I'm like, oh, I'm getting like Serena vibes for when Mm -hmm. she said that to June about the whole Jezebel's thing and how she's always felt about June and Fred. Her introduction to her, basically. You're just a whore. I was like, (laughs) yeah. I think someone in here said like Serena's a lot of things, but she's she's not a whore. Yeah. I was thinking of that, but I didn't know who said it. Do we know the name of the, the nanny? I kept trying to pay attention and I never caught it. So I don't know if they ever mentioned her name, but I really like her. She's very sweet. Yeah, she seems really sweet. Yeah. Uh, Then June's walking towards Suello in a room and he's still obviously very upset losing all those people and they discuss what to do. June tells him she doesn't trust Lawrence anymore, but says we honor those soldiers by not stopping no matter what they throw at us. And then Tuello brings up Nick Blaine. What about Nick Blaine? He tells her about the deal that he offered Nick in exchange for immunity that would ultimately get him to Canada. And he turned him down, which we think was because Mackenzie was there. And I think he even, I think Tuello even offers for June to work like in the same role as Nick in Canada. She says she's not comfortable doing that job at this time and he gets that but he tells her Nick could still have that and he can arrange a meeting today 
she thinks about it for like a second and it's like yeah set it up and she either walks out motivated or pissed off at something and ready for confrontation how did you guys read that scene and her demeanor on her way out i thought more determined i guess when she was yeah, walking out that was my initial feeling i thought both i feel like this is another parallel to 409 like it almost reminds me a little bit of Luke approaching June about seeing Nick, but like this time it's mm. Tuello, but like the mm. vibe is obviously totally different mm. because Tuello's on her side and June is in such a different place. Like it, it kind of feels like she was thrown in 409 when Luke mentioned it. And I felt like she was thrown again in this time. Like she didn't expect to meet with him again, but also she was just, you know, Tuello's dropping bombshells here. Like I offered Nick a deal. He can come to Canada and have immunity. Like things she never thought neither of them, I don't think ever even like let themselves think could be a possibility. So I think hearing that not only did Tuello offer him to come, but he could fight from Canada and have immunity. Like she's like, why would he not say yes to mm -hmm. that? Yeah. But then to, to go on that, you know, he also offered her the same chance to work Mm -hmm. with him against Gilead and she turned him down the same way Nick turned him down. But yeah, because the time wasn't right for her, just like at the time for Nick, it it was not right for him. And Mm -hmm. It's really, it's a really interesting parallel though, that I I have to think has to be deliberate because if you look at Nick's line to Twello, what he says is, yeah, no, I can't do that right now. And when Twello makes the almost the exact same pitch to um to June using the same language, saying you can make an impact too. And he gives his pitch about why she's so important and why she would be a symbol. But her line is almost identical, saying, I'm not comfortable doing that right now. Yeah. I feel like this season we're seeing Nick and June on a parallel track. And when when she turned him down, to me, I was like, holy shit, that's like it's like their track and converging. Cause basically in the yep. beginning, in the beginning, they're both a mess. Like literally in episode one, the first like five minutes, they're both just mentally, emotionally a disaster, a mess. They're depressed and everything. And and then like June's working on her relationship with Luke and Nick is married and is mm-hmm. I guess you'll say like accepting it or working on that. And then Mm -hmm. like they, they both are going on these journeys where they're trying, like like Max said in an interview, like they're both trying to make it work. They're trying on these shoes. Like Max Mm -hmm. said that he's trying on the Gilead shoes and finds out it's not going to work. And I feel like that's what they're both doing. Like they're both, they both have these obligations yeah. That they're trying to hold on to and see if they can work. And then they both have had situations happen where they get like an epiphany or like a change of heart. Like June has the whole thing with Serena and the birth. And then mm-hmm. Nick has shooting Putnam, which I think was a turning point for him. So when as much as it like made me sad that, you know, June has to find out that Nick was offered a deal and turn it down in a way I was kind of excited because I'm like, I feel like because what I predicted was going to happen was that their their journeys would be similar. And then toward in these last two episodes, they would start to converge and then they mm-hmm. would end up like you said, everything in the show just seems very purposeful. And I just all along, I felt like this has all been purposeful. Like we're seeing these cracks in the, the marriage of June and or yeah, June and Luke and that it doesn't seem like it's going to work. And mm-hmm. Obviously, Nick is affectionate with Rose, but he's not in love with her. Like, this Mm -mm. is not a real marriage. So I guess I just feel hopeful that this is like the beginning of things kind of like, you know, like I said, converging in the finale. Because I think of like in season four, the three big episodes for Nick and June were episodes three, nine and ten. And in three of this season, we saw lots of parallels between the bridge scene from last year. And then in this episode, there's so many parallels to 409. Mm -hmm. So then it makes me wonder, like, are we going to see what are we going to see in the finale? Because they obviously had a big moment at the end. We'll see. But also another thing that I thought was interesting, too, was that in episode eight, Lawrence had said to June, like, New Bethlehem is better than the whole May Day idea. Like, May Day is not going to work. Like, he's trying to persuade her not to join that because he knows she would be a badass in that. And, you know, June, like, we really want to see June be a part of May Day and go underground. And she hadn't, you know, it didn't. I, I thought we'd see more of that this season and we haven't. You know, as soon as she went to see Tuello, like, she says she seems like she's actually ready to fight. Like it's always been about Hannah. We know it's always going to be about Hannah, but for the first time, I actually felt like it was more like she's looking at the greater good now and not just Hannah because her mindset, like she's in a much better place than she's ever been mentally since, be- since getting to Canada. Then Serena's in the fertility center campaigning for Gilead, showing them what a success it was. 
she and her baby and the wheelers come down and, and mrs wheeler's very unhappy with serena's spotlight she tells her it's time for her to go home and rest and tomorrow mrs wheeler will come back with no one by herself and mr wheeler says it sounds like a great deal to me so it seems mrs wheeler's regained the upper hand in their marriage anyway serena accepts that she's fucked and she's gonna have to leave but she's a quick thinker and says sure but i should breastfeed no first and mrs wheeler's like no nah, let me get my bottle and the maid sweeps in for the win she's amazing she clearly lies and says, oh, I forgot the bottle. Sorry. She's buying Serena time and a possible exit. And I love her. Especially cool since Rita arranged June and Holly's escape, even though June came back. And I don't see that happening here. Uh, Mrs. Wheeler's pissed, but she can't very well starve the baby at her new fertility center grand opening. So Serena walks out of the main room. She looks back kind of in slow-mo. The maid had opened the door for her and given her a bag. It's like, thank you. They have a little sun. Goodbye. And then Serena makes a run for it. She runs outside. She's trying to stop cars outside the center. And when they won't stop, she steps in front of the last car and it nearly hits her. And she turns. It's an awesome scene. She begs her to help her save her son. And the lovely blue haired lady in the driver's seat agrees. And they speed off. It's so bad because I'm like, <laughs> I was cheering for Serena to get the fuck out of there. And I'm like, oh my God, this is Serena. Why do I want her to like escape? Like, yeah, right. I don't want her to, but I do. I felt the same way. Oh, it's so annoying. You know, Mrs. Wheeler shouldn't win. So that's, that's one thing in your defense, but yeah. I get it. I thought it was a very strange thing. I mean, as, as, um, as strict as the Wheelers have been as, and as controlling that they would even allow her to go off to the side to breastfeed just because and 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 the nanny takes her directly to the exit door and the Martha like directed her right there well done Good yeah job, Martha. <laughs> also do you guys all think that I bet she was intending for Serena to do this that she was helping her yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. so yeah she just watched her get slapped and we watched like that like settle on her and yeah and there's even like a window through the door that Serena looks back through. And I'm like, this is all so obvious. Like, why aren't they paying attention to her? Like eagle eye, like watching her and then stop it. I mean, it just seems strange that she was even able to get away with this because they're so controlling of her. Where's her security detail? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, she was breastfeeding, so she did need like some privacy. So but if she's being treated like a handmaid, do they care if she gets privacy? You know, some people are really offended by women um, breastfeeding in public. So maybe Mr. Wheeler is one of those people. I think Alanis would be disgusted yeah. if Serena just pulled out her boob. She probably yeah. would. Yeah. 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 Fertility center. Yeah. yeah. So this was one of the scenes we got to watch them film when we were, um, the bunch of us went to Toronto and we got to watch Bradley direct and it was really exciting. And, and it's, it's so interesting because as I'm watching this scene, I can, even though we're not, obviously we're not in the shot, but I can see over in the direction to where all of us were kind of huddled yeah. off to the side and watching, we, we watched both the stand in the stunt double come in and, and to stand in for Serena's shots. And then we saw Yvonne come out and do a lot of the same shots. And it was just, it's, and it's it's always amazing to me how we watch them for hours for this little shot that five hours yeah like, five yeah. hours and, and for this little shot that took a few seconds it's just amazing yeah so all we saw of this particular scene is Serena running out of the fertility center trying to get in a car and we were like who's chasing her why isn't June coming out after yeah, yeah. what's going on yeah we, we didn't know what the urgency was why yeah. she was running out of the building yeah like we we're like somebody's trying to steal her baby who is it it must be June or one of her minions and as it turns out Serena's just trying to steal her own baby yeah. <laughs> but I thought that was like a delightful reveal months yeah. later when we were like why would June's in there trying to steal her baby somebody's stealing her baby <laughs> Nope, she's stealing Because well, we knew nothing about the wheelers. No, the wheelers were. Yeah. yeah. No, it was amazing. I loved it. One other thing I liked about this scene is that you can you can tell who wears the pants because um, when she said she's going to go breastfeed, Mrs. Wheeler's like, don't take too long. And Mr. Wheeler says, I think that's up to little Noah, isn't it? And the face <laughs> that Mrs. Wheeler gave Mr. Wheeler was yes. so It was funny. amazing. And his, his face <laughs> yeah. in response, the way his face just falls in response yeah. was amazing. He's like, he oh, knew he was shit. in trouble. <laughs> yeah, he's going to get in trouble. I really love him. Yeah. All right, and now for the Nick and June scene we have been waiting for for eight weeks. Well, really like a year and a half. And for me personally, I was hoping for more. First of all, I think they're back at the Magdalene School, like the backside of it, where they met up at 409. 
I thought it was really cute how it started out with Nick on the stairs smoking, like he always did in Gilead at his apartment above the garage. He's got a shorter haircut now, presumably meant to make him look older. June's looking absolutely gorgeous. And Leslie, the costume designer for the season of The Handmaid's Tale, actually said they do try to make June look her prettiest for Nick. Or extra pretty for Nick. And her amazing interview comes out the Friday after episode 10. It's Friday. But back to this episode. After the first exciting shot on the stairs, my stomach immediately fell right off the cliff when he tells her, I wish you'd said yes. And just to confirm she's not insane, she asked New Bethlehem. And Nick says, yeah. So let's just stop here for a second because this is very confusing. Nick risked his life several times to get June and Holly out of Gilead in season two. He not only arranged her first escape through Mayday the moment he found out she was pregnant, he also held Brad up at gunpoint for a whole night so she could escape the second time. But then you'll remember she handed Holly to Emily and came back. And when she did come back to the Waterford house, Nick was absolutely furious with her for doing so. So the beauty of Nick's character for me is how, it's not just how very much he loves her, but at the same time, how completely like selflessly he loves her. And he always wants her to be safe and free above all else. And that's the only reason that I care about this character the way that I do. So it's it's very disappointing to me to see them try to 180 that of all things after four years of complete consistency. Like he would never willingly encourage her anywhere near any version of Gilead again, and especially not with his daughter. That is not Nick. For me, this is not Nick. So you guys' thoughts on this topic before we handle the rest of the meeting. Kimberly, you usually disagree with me, and I truly love that about you. So hit me with your defense, please. I uh, No, I, d- I don't think I have a defense for this one. I don't. There's no way that Nick, for me, would want Nicole in New Bethlehem. That's like, oh, Nicole and June in New Bethlehem. There's no fucking way. This is basically all I wanted to say about this scene. Um, To go on you, what you just said, Kate. I felt this was the most out of character Nick has been or like for all five seasons. And it was so much to the point that after the first time I watched this, I was absolutely crushed thinking that, you know, we're losing who he was and that, you know, this character he's been for June, he's been so loving and kind and devoted and dedicated to getting her out and making sure she's safe. You know, he's been this bright light for her in this dark place. And um, without going into too many details, uh, I did experience a pretty sudden tragic public loss a few years ago and uh in the aftermath of it my one solace was going to bed at night and watching Nick and June scenes it helped me remember you know that even through really dark times there's always something that's good to be found and to have thank you for sharing that yeah of course yeah in addition to Nick always prioritizing June's safety and the safety of his daughter the other thing that struck me about this is that he's never been naive. And in the previous episode, and since it's aired, we've seen a lot of comments about this too, is that people were getting the sense that Nick was not buying into everything that Lawrence was selling about New Bethlehem. People were thinking that he was just playing along. And it really had that vibe that he was um, like in the scene where they're at, they're at New Bethlehem, all of the answers that Nick gave to Lawrence were they they were all sort of dodgy they, he was answering questions with questions he wasn't really giving him you know direct answers like you really think so could you now you know interesting proposition this is full of risks so most people were getting the impression as well as myself that he was not buying into everything that Lawrence was selling and um in addition to that like he's always been a pragmatic character it's how he's survived this long in Gilead he always thinks 12 steps ahead he isn't impulsive That, you know, that's where he and June differ. He's not impulsive. He thinks everything through. So he's always very cautious before making any decision, especially decisions that impact June. So it just, if if this, what would have played out more in character to me is instead of saying, I wish you'd said yes to Lawrence's offer, rather asking her, what did Lawrence tell you or what promise, what did Lawrence promise you? Because I feel like this would have been the opportunity for Nick and June to compare notes about what's going on with, with Lawrence. Now, I don't know necessarily that he would suspect Lawrence, but at the same time, he would also want to warn her or be the one to blow the whistle. If he's sensing on any level that New Bethlehem, you know, isn't what Lawrence is pitching to her, you know, because the last time they spoke, he said, keep yourself safe, keep Nicole safe. And I would think that that would be the message he would be sending her this time he would be the one to blow the whistle and say this isn't safe new bethlehem is a mirage stay in canada he's so much smarter than 
how they're making them out to be in this situation. I mean, all of us are. Everybody on the internet is. Everybody on Twitter is. Everybody is saying, no, she can't go to New Bethlehem, obviously, because power changes too quickly in Gilead. Let's just say Lawrence is being genuine. Power yeah. changes too quickly in Gilead. Nothing can be guaranteed. So he would never allow his child yeah. or his love to come back into Gilead, into New Bethlehem, so that he could play neighbors with them. Like, and June never. is Gilead's number one, like, public enemy number one they hate exactly. her she'd be the first one to go and he knows that and and he's heard Mackenzie say over and over again June Osborne is a cancer we need to cut the cancer out I mean he knows that June is being threatened by Mackenzie so the only thing I can think of in this scene that if Nick is just going along with it that maybe he feels like he's being watched I did notice that he was looking around quite a lot when they were talking and I just hope that was the reason that he was the way that he was all season he's been like watching like they've made it a big point to keep saying nick's a puppy he's like learning the ropes like he making it clear that he's the new guy and you know like in episode six it felt i felt like it was pretty obvious how nick was feeling like he's watching both lawrence and Putnam like he, you know they said the line like I'm learning a lot from you guys and I feel like he's been like quietly like in the shadows just paying attention and taking notes and I'm hoping that this is more of like the whole spy and a spy and a spy thing where he's trying to pretend like he's into this new Bethlehem thing when he's really not when I watched episode eight I, at first I was kind of confused on what his thoughts were on new Bethlehem but then I rewatched it with my husband and it's funny to me because my husband is he loves the show but like he watches it once and that's it he has no investment in like anything or nick and june like i do but i said like what do you think about nick's thoughts and he's like it's obvious to me that he doesn't buy it but he's playing along and he's probably just trying to like plot something so the only thing that i could think of i mean it was really strange to me that he was being so antsy with june and like looking around and it reminded me of episode what was episode three where he we felt like when he was in the gazebo it seemed like he was being watched like i got the same vibes from him So I was hoping maybe he said that, I don't know, just to like throw even June off to not suspect that he's up to something. The only other theory that I could think of as to why he would say that or act that way is that he's seriously depressed and is just a wreck. But I I do feel like it's obvious that Nick is in a very bad place right now, like mentally. In 409, he was wrecked by seeing June and having to say goodbye and when I first watched that it was like startling to me how just destroyed he was so I kind of feel like if he's finding out he's got to meet June again and they're going to that same place and like now he knows that Rose is pregnant and he's like seriously fucked and can't leave then maybe he's like thinking if I let myself be the way I normally am with June like this will destroy me like there's no coming back for me like I can't go back to Gilead now again now with a pregnant wife and keep going on so that's the only other explanation I have yeah June yells at Nick for not taking Twilla's deal they argue over the logistics of their ongoing affair and Nick's asking why she didn't bring her family to him in New Bethlehem She's asking why he didn't bring his family to her in Canada. And it's so interesting that they just want to be together, even if it means bringing their families too. He tells her he can't come to Canada because Rose loves Gilead. Because what is there not to love? And then June's angrily pointing out the reality of Gilead. You can have to get your wife pregnant. What if they make you have a handmaid and your wife has to hold her down? And he cuts her off and tells her she's pregnant already. Rose is pregnant. And June stops dead in her tracks and tries to absorb that blow. And later Nick says he has to take care of his family, which I feel is another out of character line because June and Holly are also his family. And June's all just bring her too. Avi, I mean, I have Luke. And they're talking about these people like they're pets they can't get rid of. Pure baggage. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, that's how it sounds. <laughs> what was interesting to me about that was that they've just shown us how many episodes, eight episodes of June and Luke trying so hard to legitimately make their marriage work. And she's still in this moment speaking about Luke that way. So she also said she has Nicole though as well. And Nicole, she said, right. Yeah, she Nicole. said that. Yeah. And she mentioned both families. So she's mm-hmm. thinking like uh, a, both our families. Yeah. Yes. But that's where I felt like he was pushing her away in a way, like by saying my family and your family. And she's like our families. Like it seemed like she was kind of like trying to remind him. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing is, the, the thing that made me that made me think of is, is that June has never really given him a real reason to hope that 
there could ever be anything between them beyond the period of time they had together in Gilead, because he always knew, I think, silently that once she got out, she would be reunited with her husband. And ever since that's happened, I don't think he's seen anything to make him think that even though he knows she still loves him. And when they have these moments together, they're like stolen moments. And then like Ginger was saying earlier, it destroys him when he has her for a moment and he indulges in this moment. And then he has to walk away and go back to his sad life in Gilead. So I don't think he's forgotten about the fact that June and and Nicole are also his family. But I think that for his own self-preservation, he's had to form his own life in Gilead because he knows she has her life outside of Gilead. And it's, it's even though he's not in love with Rose the way that he's in love with June, and even though in his perfect world, he would love nothing more than for, for he and June and Nicole to be a family together, it's not a reality for him. And I can't really blame him for, for wanting to carve out a little piece of I don't know, something to call his own in Gilead because that's his reality at the moment. This episode is trying to sell us that that's not what he's doing. He's also trying to bring like, have his cake and eat it too and bring June and Nicole and... I do question the Nicole part at this stage because when Lawrence first pitched it to to June, he did include Nicole. Um, but between that pitch and the phone call, if the focus really narrowed down onto June, and in this particular episode, the subject of bringing Nicole to New Bethlehem doesn't even really seem to be on the table. Okay, so maybe Nick does not like bringing Holly. I would hope so. I did like how June is in this scene because after this whole season of trying again with Luke, it was explicitly obvious that she's still deeply in love with Nick. June was definitely within what we're used to seeing with of her when she's in these scenes with Nick, where she just immediately feels all the love that she has for him. And, you know, in spite of herself, I mean, maybe she would, she would like to be able to move on with Luke, but that she just does not feel it the same way when she's with him. And we've seen it all season, even though they've tried, but when she's with Nick, it just clicks back into place. And she's, she, you know, it's very, just very clear how much she's still, she's still in love with him. It jumped out at me though, where she just said what she really feels to Luke Like that, I mean, I personally have been waiting for her to tell him, like, I I think it's been obvious that she's been upset about the whole him not coming to find her in seven years. I don't know. She told him her real feelings and she immediately apologized. And that made me upset that she felt like she had to do that because she needed to be honest with him. And then here she comes to see Nick and she just comes right in there like fiery, badass June. Like she's got her spark back. They're, They're arguing a little bit about it. And she doesn't apologize. Like she's strong in her feelings. And I think for me, it was really great to see her. It almost felt like she was fighting for Nick here. Like she was ready Mm -hmm. to have this argument. And I think she was going to keep going. Like I actually kind of got the vibes. Like when she said to him in season one, like, are you happy with this bullshit life? It felt like that's where she was going with that. But then once he said that Rose is pregnant, like it kind of stopped that because like she said later on, I don't want to, I don't want to be trouble for you. Mm -hmm. So I think she realized like, fuck, now that she's pregnant, like this changes the game. Yeah. Finally, the argument weaves its way back to their normal closeness, their natural closeness. Well, this is a fine mess, isn't it? And he recycles. It's going to be hard to see you line. And she recycles. I don't want to make trouble for you line. And then he asks her very genuinely to tell Nicole he misses her. And he thinks about her all the time. Will she do that for him? And of course. And then he says he should go. Because it's been 90 seconds or something after God knows how long of a drive. And how many logistics were involved in giving this meeting. That's why I think he's being watched. I was wondering, though, if he's being watched, though, why would why would he say I love you to her? Because he always, because he has to. I thought that when he said about the baby and he was really like sad, like he, he didn't want yeah. the, the whole talk, um, but he changed when he approached to June. So for me, he's being genuine when yeah. he's close to June, not yeah. before. I agree. The times I thought he was most genuine I will say was when he was saying the stuff about Holly like Mm -hmm. tell her I love her and then when he said I love you those are the two times I was like there he might he might still be there yeah Yeah. see what also made me feel like he was being spied on was the fact that the whole time again he kept looking around and seemed anxious but then as soon as he like stared into her eyes like he he made it he purposely stared at her and made the deep eye contact and said I love you and like yeah 
It's like he forgot himself in that moment. Mm-hmm. It is. And, and I feel like there was actually a moment where I saw him like start to fall into her again mm-hmm. and fall into their old ways. Mm-hmm. And then he stopped himself because he knows if I do that, like it, I can't, he put that right. wall back up, which there's never been walls between them, but I, I really feel like he feels like he needs to do that in order to leave. The moment where she says this is a fine mess just really resonated with me because it just told me everything I needed to know about where she stands right now, emotionally speaking, about where where we what we've been seeing her trying to do with Luke and where she's at with and how she truly genuinely feels about Nick. And because the current situation was already messy and complicated, they're madly in love and they want more than anything to be together, but they're unfortunately married to the wrong people, which was already, you know, what she thought was already complicated enough, but it's also like something that they could have maneuvered and they could have found a way path forward. But as soon as he finds, she finds out that Rose is pregnant, it's like the chasm between them just became broader and deeper and um, harder for them to clear a path. So it, that just this is a fine mess just summed all that up in just that tiny little line yeah I think that like the pregnancy for me is also another really excessively heartbreaking moment in the season Mm -hmm. honestly that hurt me the most I just I do not believe that Nick would do that so quickly no he would find ways not to yeah yeah no more comments on the scene but I did want to say I forgot to mention their little jokey joke about like she's like oh you drove yourself and he's like yeah I'm not important enough for a driver and the way they look at each other then and it's just very sweet and their mutual I love yous of course are amazing yeah but at the end when she says to him children look to their fathers you know set an example I feel like she's trying to like subtly hint to him like think of Nicole think of your whatever future baby Mm -hmm. and I I do kind of feel like that's you know they've always we always talk about how their relationship they speak in code like they don't have to say anything but they know how each other is feeling and I feel like that was kind of her like speaking in code to him yeah then everyone is celebrating Rose's pregnancy at Lawrence's house one of the wives says something snarky about Aunt Lydia's presence and Naomi swoops in to say the command that was the commander's request that she escort her and then another wife talks shit to Rose about having a baby with a disability Calhoun's wife right yeah yeah, yeah. and we're with the commanders in a separate room Mackenzie celebrating their win at the wife school even North Korea is proud of them well done that's quite the compliment for a fascist regime. Even Lawrence jokes, any club that would have me as a member. And Nick <laughs> that was fun. is still laughing at Lawrence's jokes. Yeah. Lawrence tries to change the subject. It was all in all a success. And Mackenzie says, well, June Osborne is still stirring up trouble. It's about time we fix that problem. Don't you agree? And Nick is, the camera goes to Nick. He's clearly bothered. And Lawrence says, and Lawrence clearly doesn't want to say this, but he says, well, it's certainly worth considering because he's on the spot. And then the men join the women and Nick checks in to see if Rose is okay. Lawrence walks over to Naomi. Mackenzie compliments him for impressing him and surprising him. Is this regarding the school attack or Naomi? I'm unsure. Anyway, he very awkwardly puts his hand on her shoulder then and she very awkwardly doesn't, you know, swat it off like she clearly wants to. Lawrence was the one putting on a show here. Yeah. Did you guys notice the the wedding ring on Lawrence's hand? It could have been from Eleanor, but uh, then I was like, oh, maybe it's for Naomi. That's interesting. I thought that this scene was um, the commitment, the engagement. Part yeah. 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 That's what I thought yeah. Too. yeah, I think so too. I love Lawrence's line about any club that would have me as a member, which is a take on the Groucho Marx quote I don't want to belong to any club that would accept me as a member and I liked that Nick smirks getting his joke but it didn't seem like anybody else got the joke or the self-deprecating joke right if Mackenzie know that he didn't laugh no he wouldn't (laughs) no he doesn't seem like the type of person to laugh there no No, no. (laughs) one more thing I wanted to say was that I think Mrs. Calhoun is really rude and I I don't yes and I don't like her very much because that was so mean to Rose. I was like mm-hmm. feeling really bad for her in that moment. Yeah, she's definitely one of those who just says whatever pops into her brain, like no filter. Yeah. The other comment I had was um, Lawrence had a line about defying expectations at the very end. And it did seem like something happened within this whole scene with the commanders that seemed to shift things for Nick, maybe just a little bit. And after he said the thing about defying expectations, it just made me think that maybe Nick's expectations are the ones that he's defying or one of them. It just makes me think of Wicked, the musical. 
defying gravity. Defying gravity. <laughs> and then the commanders had said to him, uh, to Lawrence, you're truly one of us now, praise be. And that's when Nick holds the glass up, but the look he gives him, it's like right there, like this whole scene, I feel like if Nick didn't realize before, um, then he at least realizes now that Lawrence is no longer like whatever relationship or alliance they had together, like that's cut now. Like he really is on his own and doesn't have anybody in his corner. So as much as that is awful and it makes my heart break for Nick to think that he doesn't have anybody now, like in Gilead, at least it gives me hope that maybe he'll take Tuello's offer or do something huge in the finale. So we'll see. Then in Little America, Tuello is reading the names of all the soldiers killed in the Hannah rescue attempt. And I do I do like the previous scene in season two, I think, when they were doing this after the Red Center bombing. But this is now. There are protesters because people are assholes and they're loudly protesting as Tuello is reading the names and then he calls Elijah's daughter up to read the Pledge of Allegiance. And she stumbles through the allegiance and June asks her mom if she can help her because Emma's mom is beside her and her and her mom is in tears and she nods yes and it's adorable. And then June walks forward and she and Emma are saying the pledge together. June's on her knees and then she stands up. The protesters are very distracting plus Emma's dad has just died. Rita and Moira are there too. You see Rita's single pearl necklace in honor of her son. And then there are gunshots. There's a slow moment where June looks down at Emma and then she dives on top of her to protect her as we see bullets being fired through the American flag. Fucking heartbreaking ending. I mean, the fucking kid's dad just died and now they're firing shots at them. It's just really sad. It's a very sad ending. Yeah. Do we think this was Gilead trying to assassinate her? That was my thought, especially coming off of the last scene where they were talking about taking care of her and... Yeah. I sure hope so, because, like, yeah. why do people shoot refugees? Even you're unhappy in your own town. You really, yeah. like, protest, like, shoot them. To, and a separate note I had, did anybody catch the way Luke looked so uncomfortable and strange and awkward during the Pledge of the Allegiance? I couldn't figure out why, because he was kind of looking to the side. He wasn't, he wasn't oh, reciting it with them. So, yeah. I think he feels guilty that, you know, they're the reason that all these people are dead. Yeah, maybe. So. And he hasn't been in that position before and she has. Yeah, that's true. As fucked up as it is. Mm-hmm. Like, this is his first time through it. That's true. Okay, I think that's a wrap on our analysis of season five, episode nine. Come back next week for the season finale. Um, but actually come back in two days for our interview with Ever Carradine and Stephen Kunkin, who play Yay. the Putnams. And it's amazing. It was a very enjoyable two hours of our life, which hopefully we can cut down to less than two hours. But come back and check it out on Friday. Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 Okay, fine. I'm just going to finish it. Hush, child. Finish it. Finish him. <laughs> Fatality. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please go in the bloopers. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.